All right, welcome back. And let's get right into it. So in the last two and a third weeks of this course, uh, there's been a lot of conceptual buildup. Actually seeing continuous functions in action, I hope will be satisfying because here's the payoff. Continuous functions are the central concept in topology. And you know, I mean, you need the definition of topology and all the examples to really understand how you know, interesting continuous functions can get. But this right here, this is like the meat of the subject. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to go through this next video. So if you remember from last video, continuous functions are these functions which you can kind of draw without taking your pen off the page. So um, right now we're just talking about functions from the unit interval into the real numbers. And I, I don't mean continuous functions in general. I just mean the continuous functions that you've seen so far in you know, math class. They're the functions that you can draw without taking your pen off the page. So this guy over here is you know, fancy and continuous and the two over on the right-hand side are not continuous. So yeah, it is true that continuous functions are the ones that you, you, know, you can't draw without taking your pen off the page, but why? Why is that the case? That's a question that I hope I can answer in this video. Before we do that though, I wanna mention that when, we, when we're actually drawing these functions, um, in many ways, we're not actually drawing the functions themselves so much as, well, the image of the function, the, the, the sort of visible part of the function. And what I mean by image is just this. So let f from x to y be any function. The image of f is a subset of y, so it's a set of points in y that are of the form f of x for some x in x. So I like to think of f as a kind of projector, you know, a thing that, uh, takes points in x and sends them over to y. Uh, x is kind of a film negative, and y is a sort of screen. And here you're just sort of projecting uh, the image that's on the film down onto the screen. And that's exactly what the image of a function actually is. So let me give you just a quick example. Um, I mean, we were looking at this example in the last video. The image of, of that function f from abc to one, two, three, four, five well, it's just the points three and four, because those are the only points that are actually, you know, actually have something sent to them in X. All right, so let's talk about connectedness. Connectedness is exactly that property of not having to take your pen off the page when you're drawing it. It's, it's that property that um, we kind of really mean when we're talking about continuity of real functions. Um, and I'd like to give you a, a you know a, f a very solid and precise definition of connectedness just in topology in general, um, but it is actually easier to define disconnectedness first. So let's actually do that. So what does it mean for a set in a space to be disconnected? So given some space, you know, a blob X with a topology T, and given any subset of X, we're going to be talking about this subset Z. Uh, Z is called disconnected. If there are open sets u and v and t, which actually uh, disconnect z. So in other words, u intersect z is not empty, v intersect z is not empty, u intersect v is empty, and z is a subset of the union of u and v. I'll draw you a picture of what actually this looks like. So here's the sort of set I'm thinking of when I think of z. So I think of a kind of union of one or more parts. So, so here's, here's what I mean by this kind of Z. Z is actually the union of these two blobs. So Z consists of all the points which are in either one blob or in the other one. Okay, now U and V are actually not too hard to draw. U might look like this. So here I'm gonna draw an open set around one bean. And here's my U. And V might look like this. So here I'm going to draw a kind of squiggly, squiggly open set around the other bean in Z. And you can check that U intersect V. Uh, so U intersect V is actually empty. There's some space between U and V. U intersect Z is not empty because 
you know, this point right here is in it. V intersect Z is not empty because this point right here is in it. And Z is actually a subset of the union. It's somewhere amongst these two blobs right here. So this is what I mean by Z is disconnected. And uh, I haven't written it here, but of course, Z is connected if it is not disconnected. So in other words, Z is connected if we can't find these sets U and V, these open sets U and V. So let's look at some examples of uh, disconnected and connected spaces, and we'll go. Uh, I'll go along and I'll explain which one's which. So if you'll remember that space that Angela told you about, the one that was regular but not T0, uh, well, okay, regular and T0 are not actually important properties right now. I, I really just want to know whether or not this whole space is connected. So it's also important to note that actually in this example, I'm taking Z to be the whole space X, or X is the space consisting of four points, one, two, hat, and dog. So one, two is actually all in one open set right here, and hat and dog is in another open set. And so we can actually take this one to be u and this one to be v, and we can check the four conditions. So what was the first one again? I think it was u intersect 1, 2. Yeah, OK, so u intersect 1, 2 is non-empty. u intersect hat dog is non-empty. U intersect V is empty. There's some space between U and V. Um, and actually, Z, which is X, so the set of all points right here, is a subset of U union V. So this shows that this space is actually disconnected. OK, so here's another interesting example. This is the interval from 0 to 1. And here I am thinking about it as a subspace of the real numbers. Now, as a subspace of the real numbers, there are three kinds of basic open set in the interval. So there's this one, which consists of all the points between two numbers, between A and B, and not including A or B. There's also these ones. So the open sets that include 0 and, are, and go up to about a, so they're all the points between 0 and a, including 0. And there's also this open set over here, which starts at b. It contains all the points which are to the right of b, and it includes 1. So half open interval from 0 to a is open in this topology. The open interval from A to B is open in this topology, and the half open interval from B up to 1 is in this topology. And actually, every open set is a union of sets like this. OK, so let's suppose U and V cover the whole unit interval. And remember, here again, I am taking z to be x. I'm asking if the whole space is connected. So let's suppose u and v are non-empty open sets, and that they actually cover the whole unit interval. So every real number between 0 and 1 is actually in one of these two sets. Well. Since u and v are both unions of sets of these kinds, and since every real number is in one of them, that must mean that this interval right here, from b all the way up until 1, for some b, 
is in either u or v. And now, since it doesn't matter if I you know, assume for the moment it's in v or if it's in u, let's actually just assume that it's in u. So for some b, the half open interval from b all the way up until 1 is actually a subset of u. OK, but there could be lots of b's. So let's actually just take the smallest one. Take the smallest b. If we choose the smallest possible b such that this half open interval is in u, OK, that actually means that this b is not in u. Well, because if the b were in u, then we could have chosen a smaller b, such that you know, a half open interval from b to 1 actually isn't in u, or sorry, is in u. So this is not in u. So actually, because u and v cover the whole interval, b is in v. OK, now, now here's where things get interesting. Now, v is also a union of open sets of this form. Now, v is certainly not, v certainly doesn't contain any intervals that include 1. Those points are all in, in u. And uh, well, I mean, I guess it could. But in particular, there's some, there's got to be some interval, some open interval, could possibly contain 1, I guess. Some open interval contained in V that actually uh, includes B. So B is in some open interval that's in V. OK, but you should notice now that, uh, well, I'm using probably too many colors, but you should notice now that all these points right here, the ones that are in pink, are both in U and in V. So that means that U intersect v is not empty. And that was one of the conditions that we needed in order to uh, ensure that the interval, um, that a space or a set was actually disconnected, that u and v uh, had an empty intersection. But no, no open sets that cover u uh, 0 to 1, no pair of open sets that covers 0 to 1 uh, can have an empty intersection. So that's what we've just shown. So actually, the open interval is connected. So this right here, this guy is connected. And I apologize for, uh, you know, scribbling all over the screen like this. OK, so here's another interesting example. Uh, this is the Cantor set. And you might recognize it as um, uh, hopefully you, you recognize it as uh, the space of all paths through this infinite binary tree. And of course, all of these keep going. All of these branches keep going infinitely. So the Cantor set is actually disconnected. And in fact, it is very disconnected. In a, a sense, I'll explain in a second. Now, first of all, I can draw these two basic open sets that you might recognize as d of 0 and d of 1. And, and you know, of course, no sequence both starts with a 0 and a 1. So that's what these sets are, if you'll remember. This is the set of all sequences starting with 0. And here's the set of all sequences starting with 1. No sequence starts with either 0 or 1, but every sequence has to start with either 0 or 1. So these two basic open sets, which are disjoint, as you can see in the picture, uh, actually disconnect the Cantor set. Now, what do I mean by very disconnected? Well, um, OK, let, let, me, let me just explain. Actually, both of these open sets uh, are themselves disconnected. And those open sets are also disconnected. And 
so on and so forth. So the only subsets of the Cantor set, which are, which are connected, so the only connected subsets have one point. So they look like this. So here's a connected subset, this guy right here, just the path that starts with one and then goes to zero and then one and then zero and then one and then zero and then one and zero and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the idea that we started this video with. Suppose we have two spaces x and t and y and t prime, and we have a function between them which is continuous. If x is connected, then the image of x under f should also be connected. So the image of f, the thing that we draw, is actually connected when x is connected. Um, I'd actually like to prove this for you uh, in a picture. Um, but I should warn you that I'm, I'm not going to prove this exact statement. I'm actually going to take something called the contrapositive. It's not important that it's called the contrapositive, um, but basically it says the same thing. So what it says is that if the image is disconnected, then so must x have been disconnected. So you should try to convince yourself for a second that these two statements are the same, that if x is connected, so is f, the image of f, uh, okay, well, remember all this is saying is that, okay, well, if the image of f is disconnected, well, we can't have the image, or we can't have x connected, because that would, that would be the opposite of this statement. So this and this are actually just the same statement. This is what I'm going to show you. If the image is disconnected, then so is x. Now, I, I should maybe remind you quickly that in the previous video, we defined what the inverse of a set is. So if you're given a z, which is a subset of y, f inverse of z is the set of all points x in x, such that f of x is in z. So this is you know, tracing back the function from z into x. Okay, and we're going to use exactly that idea to prove this statement. So here's an x, and here's a y. I'm just going to take the image of my function x and my, my function f in y, and I'm going to sort of, I'm going to just suppose uh, which is what we should do, uh, suppose that the image is disconnected. And you should already see that there's some kind of, there's an issue here. Somehow I haven't drawn x properly. I've drawn x as if it's connected, uh, but its image is not. And here are just two parts of x, uh, which we're going to be able to separate with open sets. So let's separate these two parts of the image of x with open sets. So here we're assuming, remember, that the image of x is disconnected. And so there are these u and v such that, well, what was it again? It was that u intersect the image of x is non-empty. Uh, whoops. v intersect the image of x is non empty, u intersect v is empty, and while well, the image of x is a subset of u union v. Remember, these are the important properties. Okay, so I'm going to use that idea from before, the inverse image idea, and I'm just going to take the inverse images of v and u. Okay, so now since f inverse 
of v comes from v, and u and v intersect, the image of x is non-empty. Actually, f inverse v is non-empty. There is some point which is in the image of, of x that's in v, and so actually this point has to come from f inverse v. Okay, great. So there's actually some point in f inverse v. And I'll color in f inverse v. Okay, well, the same thing applies to f inverse of u. f inverse of u is non empty too. There's some point in f inverse u because it has to be sent into u. Okay. So f inverse of u is also non empty. Okay. So f inverse of v intersect u. Okay, this is a little trickier. f inverse of v intersect u is actually the same thing as f inverse of v intersect f inverse of u. Um, and just to explain that, uh, a point gets sent into v intersect u uh, by f if and only if, well, um, it both gets sent into v and into u. Okay, well, anyways, f inverse of v intersect f inverse of u, this actually has to be empty. And the reason why is that if there were a point in both f inverse of v and f in, in f inverse of u, then f would send that point into the intersection. But okay, well, the intersection of u and v is empty. So this can't, this, this can't possibly exist. There's no such point. f inverse of v intersect f inverse of u is empty. And lastly, of course, x is a subset of f inverse of u union f inverse of v. And the reason why is just that every point in x got sent to either a point in u or some point in v. That was kind of what we assumed this whole pink spot right here was the whole image of x. Everything that x gets sent to is somewhere in here. Okay, so are we done? Just about. The last thing that I want to remind you about is that we actually assumed that f was continuous, which just meant that f inverse of open sets, whoops, f inverse of an open set is an open set. So that means that f inverse of v is open and f inverse of u is also open because u and v were open sets in y. So that means that x has these two open sets, f inverse of v and f inverse of u, such that both of them are non-empty, their intersection is empty, and they cover the whole space. So this means that x is disconnected. And there, we've proven the theorem. Remember as well that the whole point of this theorem was to show that the image of a connected set is connected. And that was the same statement that we just proved. Let's look at a quick example, the example that we started with. So we call a path in the plane uh, just a continuous function from the unit interval, so from the, the interval from 0 to 1, into r squared. So r squared is just the xy plane. These are this is the set of all xy coordinates. A path is really quite easy to imagine. You start at f of 0, so you start at some point over here, and then you take your pen and you draw along all the way until you hit f of 1. So here I've got even a loop-de-loop -loop in my path. What we learned from the theorem the, in, the, in the previous slide was that you actually don't need to take your pen off the page in order to draw this path. And that's exactly because a path is a continuous function. Okay, so could this possibly be continuous? No, 
We know that from the previous theorem, but we can actually see it very directly just by looking at this picture. Um, if I just look at the path itself, just the image of this function in the xy plane, I can draw two open sets. They're going to be kind of open beans, one around each part of the path that are disjoint, are non-empty, have non-empty intersection with each of these paths, whose union contains the whole path, and such that the path is entirely contained in the union of these two sets. So this can't possibly be a path. This can't be a continuous function into the plane. Now it's your turn. There's tons of exercises for you to try before Angela takes it away and you know, concludes this three-part course on the foundations of point set topology.